collection of conversations called Rhythms. And the past previous weeks, we've been talking about the rest. How many of you have been enjoying the, the rest portion? Of, yeah, it's been messing with me, man. Anybody else? It's like, oh, gosh, I really need this, and Lord, help me. And uh, God's been working on it. If you've missed any of the messages, you could go to our, uh, our app, the, the YouTube. You could go to our Facebook. Um, you could call me. I'll, I'll teach it to you. We'll go have a pumpkin spice latte. Come on, we're not trying to hurry up to get to the pumpkin spice latte, but you know what I'm saying. feels like it today with these clouds. But uh, we're excited to be here today, and we're entering into not the rest, but the run portion of the rhythm. And, and like a bicycle with two pedals... It is essential that we understand how the rhythm of God's grace works in this life. And so you can't ride a bike well with one pedal. It has the rest component, which is essential, but we don't rest for the sake of rest. We rest knowing that there is an absolute powerful purpose that God's called us to run in. And today we're going to talk about, that's the title of my message. If you're a note taker, go ahead and write that down. Powerful purpose, powerful purpose. Um, when I was a young person, um, I lived in Las Vegas from about 5 to 12. I was born here, moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, lived there until I was about 17. And when I was about, uh, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old, um, I found a bike from a kid's house about two blocks from mine. <laughs> and I borrowed it for a while. And me and my friends, we would ride our bikes. And so I don't know if anybody been to Las Vegas before? Yeah, we're going to pray for everybody at the altar after service. Jesus, help. And uh, so it's pretty flat there, and you can ride a skateboard everywhere. You can ride your bike everywhere. And we went out for a ride, and all of a sudden we found ourselves about 10 miles away from home, at least 10 miles. And it was getting dark, and I knew I was in trouble because uh, the street lights came on. Do you remember what that meant when the street lights came on? You better be home. And so from uh, at least 10 miles away, I could hear my mom's whistle. But I don't think it was physical. I think it was echoing in the chambers of my soul because I knew if that whistle came and I wasn't home, it was a problem. And so we were at this place called Sam's Town. I don't know if you, anybody knows what Sam's Town is in Las Vegas. But we, there was this perfect little jump there. And we were jumping our bikes. And I was like, man, we got to go, you guys. We got to go. But I was waiting my turn for the jump. And I was like, well, I got to get one more jump in. And so I go, ride my bike, do the jump. I land it, and the pedal breaks off my bike. And I was like, what kind of cheap bike? Who would pay good money for this? I didn't. <laughs> I'll tell you that. One guy uh, told me and my brother, if you guys are going to be turds, you better go lay in the grass. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what that means. But we found ourselves in the grass quite a bit. And um, so now, <laughs> forgive me, humor is disarming. It helps us. And, and so now I have a one-pedal bike, and I'm 10-plus miles from home. Street lights came on, and I knew um, that my mom would, had run out of uh, wooden spoons at our house at that point. Matter of fact, she had this thing. Uh, it was like it was supposed to be a cheese board, but it wasn't. It was universal, if you know what I'm saying. Matter of fact, it had a crack down the middle, and so when it would crack, it would pinch. And uh, so I would throw that on, out in the desert all the time, miraculously would find its way home. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did this come back? <laughs> We'd look at each other, siblings, like, did you do it? No, did you? And so I knew I was in trouble, so I had to get home, but the reality was I was at a place where I could only produce one aspect and element of getting on this bike and going, as, and I was the single leg pumper as fast as I could, and I was exhausted. <laughs> By the time I got home, and let's just say I snuck into my bed, and my mom comes in, and she goes, hey. I was like, huh, what? Sorry, I was sleeping. We'll talk about it in the morning. <laughs> so now I broke the bike that I stole, borrowed. <laughs> I'm in trouble, and I'm exhausted. And in all of this, I just know in our lives, I think we can find ourselves operating out of our own strength, running out of fear, and operating in an imbalance that doesn't necessarily equate to God's plan in which he's called us to have in the purpose for our lives. 
And today I want to break down a portion of scripture. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And as, as we exhaust these scriptures, I pray that it will empower us to get in the game and run the race in which Jesus has set out for us to run. You know, there's, there's a, a great quote from a man named Mark Twain. He said, the two most important dates in your life were the day you were born and the day that you find out why. And so every single one of us, if you have this thing that's running through your veins, it's not a pulse, that's your purpose. That's God's why in your life. And so all of us have this some of you think maybe one day you, you felt like you were operating in it and you did a, an incredible work and you felt so fulfilled, but those days have come and passed. Friends, the days have not passed. Greater are the days ahead of you than anything that's behind you. God is up to good things. He has a great work that he's pre-planned for each person to do. We just have to come back to the person that's created the plan and trust him in the process. And so as we trust Jesus, we lean in with expectation and anticipation, but it, maybe you're like me, one day in my life, I felt like I was really trying, and I felt like I was getting nowhere. I don't know if you're like me, I give myself to, to, to disciplines oftentimes, and, 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 and as soon as I blow it on the discipline, I, I just quit. Anybody else ever set a uh, New Year's resolution? Like, how are those going for you in August, right? <laughs> well, next year, <laughs> it's like, yeah, me too. But this is how God designed it. Until perfection is lost, grace can't even come in. And the problem is, is that we throw the baby out with the bathwater and we think we've got to be so perfect. We've got to make sure this thing is right on time, right on specific plan. And as soon as it goes off and derails just a little bit, we, we go, well, I guess that's not for me. No, God is for you. He's called us all. Come on, if you've got a heartbeat, if you've got a pulse, he's got a purpose and he's got a plan. And so we can't flippantly disregard just because we found ourselves falling short. Come on, we all fall short. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in this world. And there's going to be some obstacles in this life, but we have to trust ultimately that God has a perfect plan. But in this plan, it doesn't mean that we won't endure, endure pain it means that the pain will have a purpose. Let me say it like this. Work without purpose is undesired pain. But work with purpose is God's powerful grace that keeps us moving forward in spite of pain. And so we have to be willing to see past our quitting points, know that we're called to discipline ourselves, and give ourselves to due diligence out of fervor, not fear. John Maxwell says it like this, we have uphill hopes with downhill habits. And it's not that we're not willing to try or haven't tried. I'll say it like this, quit trying. Give yourselves to training. And this is what Paul is talking about, what it means to discipline ourselves, to train ourselves, to give ourselves to the honing and the shaping, the process of the, the, the character qualities of Christ that are being formed in us. And this only happens not in a day, but when we commit to him daily. And so we'll go to the scriptures now. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. It reads as this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? Somebody say run. I was running, Jenna. <laughs> I must have had about 12, Dr. Pebbles. <laughs> That's funny to some friends, but not to others, obviously. <laughs> Runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Someone say compete. In the games, they go into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. 
Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached, somebody say preach, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Friends, this is a profound portion of scripture that Paul is instructing in, in metaphors associated with sports, and I know that won't work in our day and age because nobody likes sports. Did you guys see the Seahawks on Thursday? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Preach! <laughs> Somebody's coming to the altar now because Seahawks. But we have to know that, that this thing, this diligence, this power of God's purpose in our life is only profound when we start with the end in mind. Because it's not about are we engaged and we going. It's about are we great finishers. Because the Bible will not say well started, pretty good, and somewhat faithful, sometimes servant. No, we're going to come to a day when we see Jesus face to face, face to face, and the only thing we want to hear in response is, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into your, your father's inheritance. And there's so much. People, people we think oftentimes that, that Jesus died to get, get, get me into heaven. Well, in part, but Jesus didn't die just to get you into heaven. He died to get heaven into you to get heaven through you that someone else might get to heaven and share the glorious good news of God's grace through each and every one of his beautiful creations. And the most powerful purpose we will ever know in this life is the purpose of being used by God's grace. And he knows you. And you know you. And you'll eliminate yourself because you beat yourself up more than God ever would. And his grace doesn't beat you down. It lifts you up. And it calls us to greater and empowers us to something that we could have never perceived for ourselves before that encounter. As a young person, I didn't aspire to graduate high school, go to college, to do this, to be used by God's grace in, in such a capacity but he knows the plans and the purposes he has for us declares the Lord wants to give us a hope and a future and if he has pre-planned to position you in this place today it means he has a powerful purpose for you moving forward and so I want to lean into these scriptures and exhaust a couple different words, three words to be exact. And the three words I want to engage is run, compete, and preach. And the first one is, write this down if you would, number one, run. This is our powerful decision. You got to run your race. In, in, in 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 9, verse 24, he says, do you not know that in a race... All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Now, in a day and age with uh, participation trophies, forgive me, <laughs> we're handing these things out like candy, right? It's like, like look, I got, a, I got a trophy. For what? Well, I don't know. Well, what'd you do? I stood there. Did you pick your nose? Yeah. Did you eat it? No. Here's your prize. <laughs> what? Like, we're handing these things out. Like, yeah, sure, everybody gets a prize. But everybody doesn't pay the, pay the price to see the power of God's purpose in their life. And so he's talking about a race. I love, I love these metaphors. I'm, I, my Twitter profile says I'm surprisingly athletic. <laughs> I used to play basketball. Now I look like I'm smuggling basketballs, right? I, I can throw a ball, I just can't run it down and get it, okay? So I can throw it maybe twice before I feel like my arm's going to fall off. <laughs> but I love this, this, this metaphor and this picture that Paul is painting because it's, it's contextual to the, to the community in that day. He's, he's talking about sports and it's an engagement that brings understanding. In this word, it run, in the Greek, in the original language, it, it, its root word is treka which is the same root word for track. And he's saying, like, get in 
the game. Get, get on the track. He's like, are we, are we tracking? He's not saying this is, this is about the actions of running. It's more the attitude and the mindset more than the motion. He, this is the initial engagement of understanding God's purpose and power for our life. Is saying, God, you've called me to do something that I could never do myself. And he's saying, you won't see the power of my purpose until you get in the game. we got to understand that what we're called to is beautiful. What he's given us is an opportunity to allow him to get glory out of our lives. And we, we have this misnomer, this misinterpretation of what salvation is, I think, is the problem. Now, I want to tell us what salvation is, and then I'll tell us what salvation isn't. Salvation is unmerited, unearned, undeserved, the favor of God. It was a gift. He gave it to us. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. Neither did I. The only thing we contributed to the saving grace of Jesus Christ was the sin that made it necessary. And so that's what salvation is. That's what grace is. This is what it's not. It's not cheap. But yet we thrift shop it all the time. Point in case. I have three beautiful little tax deductions. Children, forgive me. My children are amazing. I love them so much. And, and so when my daughter became um, of age, we got her into soccer. What's cuter than little kids running around a soccer ball with no purpose or direction? All they're doing is this ball and this pack of kids just kind of go like this. Like, and I'm on the side, I'm like, kick the ball in the goal. And my wife's like, honey. <laughs> I was like, sorry about that. I, I had a moment. And so they're so cute. They just go around the, the field and the ball and the pack of them. And it just lacks any purpose. And then my, my next child, my, my oldest son, middle child, Chase, he's like the sweetest little lover. And, and he's like, I want to play soccer like sissy. And we're like, okay, we'll get you in there. And he'll get the ball and he's standing in the middle of the field with his foot on, foot on the ball. And, and, and I'm going, okay, I'm not allowed to say kick it loud. So I'm like, kick it. <laughs> Was that okay, honey? <laughs> You're sure pretty. <laughs> and, and he's standing there with the ball, and he's telling the kids, no, guys, listen, Jesus loves us. And I was like. <laughs> and yet I'm holding the third born, tenacious little one on the side. He's like, put me in. I'll kick it. Put me in. And I was like, you're going to get us both in trouble, okay? <laughs> and so no matter where you are, when it comes to the natural bend of competitiveness, whether you're go, oh no, it's on like Donkey Kong, right? Or if you're like, no, let's smell the flowers and be like John, the disciple that Jesus loved and rest upon his chest. No matter what the wiring is, we have to know we have a righteous reward that's been given to us. And that's the gift of knowing the peace of God Salvation is this rest, but it also calls us to run. Because with my kids, as they're playing sports, and my son was just standing there, not kicking the ball, not participating, and at a certain point, he goes, Dad, I don't want to play anymore. And, 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 and so I start doing the calculations in my mind of like, uh, no, kid, um, this is a great teaching moment, kids. <laughs> Everyone line up. <laughs> My wife's like, whoa, what's going on? This is a great teaching moment. We're going to have all the kids sit down. Um, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a great life lesson. Um, this will help you for the rest of your life. And if you forget this, we're going to kick you out of the house. Dad, I'm seven. You're going you're gonna to find a great place, I'm sure. But I said, here's the reality. You might not realize that these sports came at a cost. Mommy and daddy paid for them. And if I pay, you stay. <laughs> Matter of fact, if I pay, you don't just stay, you play. <laughs> and hey guys, if Jesus paid, we will stay. If Jesus paid, we will play. We won't quit. We won't acquiesce. We won't back down. We know that we're called to run. 
But you can't be in the game if you're out of the game and quit and won't. And I don't, am not willing, should not be in the dialect of any follower of Jesus that understands that grace is a gift and costs you nothing, but it is not cheap. And it comes at a high premium. And Jesus paid. So we'll stay and we will play. Well, sure, I won't quit. I'll stay. Some of us, that, those words are, 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 are timely in the midst of our marriage. For some of us, those words are prominent in the midst of an impasse with some family. Come on, Jesus paid to allow the grace of his glory to produce in us incredible purpose. And we would not necessarily sign up for these circumstances, but these circumstances are what will seemingly bring awareness to the mountains of life. And we cannot see the miracles of God until we face the mountains. He says we've got to speak to the mountains. Don't just look at them. Don't just identify them. Don't just tiptoe around them. We need to speak to them and believe. But what does it mean to, to play? Well, a lot of times we think we check the box and we show up for church. That's, I'm participating. And then we say, Jesus paid it all, all to him I own. Is this thing almost over? Where are we going to lunch later? Red Robin, yum. <laughs> No, if he paid, we stay. If he paid, we play. We don't passively participate. We know how good God's grace is. He died on the cross. He did his best, and we can do no less. We engage. We lean in. We have anticipation of the power of God moving in our lives, and that's where we see the purpose of God come to pass in a great way. But the problem is, is that we endure this pain. And you know, Jesus endured a little bit of pain in his time. Matter of fact, the, the word excruciating ultimately came in the original Latin form. And it was a word that they used only to describe the pain that the cross would produce. And this is the same word here for us to understand that it's not about well-tried Somewhat diligent, sometimes engaged, relatively faithful. No, it's well done. Well done, good and faithful follower. We have to engage with diligence. We can't be flippant. This word excruciating is excruciatus. It means tormented greatly. We know that there's going to come a cost when we run. And I'm the kind of guy, like, I don't dance unless I hear music. And I'm not running unless somebody's chasing me. Matter of fact, some of you like to run. But the Bible says in Proverbs 28, the wicked run when no one's chasing them. So I just want to chastise a little bit, give you some clear correction on that one. I don't go to the gym. I made friends with a guy named Jim. And I tell my wife, his name is The Jim. And when I go see him, I'm telling her, honey, I'm going to the gym. But we make so many concessions to accommodate our comfort, friends, for us to engage in the run. It's, it's going to come at the cost of us willing to deny the comforts of this life to follow Jesus and pick up our cross. Number two, write this down if you would. So the first is run, the powerful decision. Number two is compete, the powerful decision. Discipline, powerful discipline. Verse 25, it goes on and says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. This word compete in the Greek, it, it's agatonize, and it's ultimately the same word as agony. How many of you want to sign up for this now, huh? Yeah, great. Where do I sign up? Put me on the list, right? But anybody that has ever competed at a high level, anybody that's ever endured the discipline of physical health, wellness, 
working out. What, the only reason I ever worked out really was because of sports, and, and I wanted the byproduct at the end, but I knew it came at a, cr- at a price for me to push past my quitting points and the pain. But sometimes you gotta, you got to lift heavy things if you want to be strong. We have to lift things in life to, to build the great strength that God has called us to have. It's not just going to come naturally. It's going to come supernaturally. And he says we have to compete. We have to have the powerful disciplines. Now, let me just be descriptive here a little bit. I I try to have a different spiritual emphasis and discipline every day. Uh, You know, Sunday through Saturday, worship, the word, discipleship, evangelism, generosity. Different days have different emphasis. But it doesn't mean that I'm not discipling someone on a day that I'm focused on evangelism. It means that I set the tone by pre-planning and creating a rhythm in which God would afford me the lanes of life to run in. But, But there's the old adage, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So we have to be pre-planned and predetermined. The discipline of setting ourselves up to see God move in our lives comes at the upfront cost. They say you'll pay two pains in your life. You'll either pay the, the upfront cost of discipline or you'll pay on the back end of regret. And so if we are willing as faithful followers of Jesus to follow his lead saying everybody runs, if he paid, we play and we stay, come on, we're the recipients of the goodness of the gospel of grace. And he says, and if you're in the game, you have to compete. You have to be diligent. We have to be willing to discipline ourselves and give ourselves to allowing God to work out our lives. The Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trepidation. What does that mean? Reverence and willingness to walk in his ways, to lean in with love. And, and, and the, the great prophet, Mike Tyson, he said it like this. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I don't know how many of you have ever found yourself trying, like me, trying, fail, try fail. There's only so many times that we're going to try and not succeed and get back on the track. Friends, we need to stop trying. And we have to give ourselves to training, the discipline of being willing to engage with God in a different way, a proactive approach that's not reactionary. But the problem isn't if we'll do it, It's what's the motivative. What's the motivating factor? What's the driver in our life? I remember another time when I was young, the same borrowed bike that me and my friends would ride around on, we we got offended because one of our neighbors put their Christmas lights out too early. Anybody struggle with that type of offense other than me? Uh, I don't these days. Jesus saved me. Matter of fact, when I was young, everything seemed like a, I was offended. And, and so we, we saw this neighbor. He put out his Christmas lights too early. So we're like, we're going to teach him a lesson. We're going to go break his Christmas lights. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't good. I'll tell you the whole story. And so we go over. We break his Christmas lights. We get on our bikes. And we start riding off, giggling to ourselves. <laughs> you know, like little turds. And we were going to look for a patch of grass to lay down. And so we were riding our bikes. And next thing you know, we hear this guy come out like Yosemite Sam. He, the rootness, tootness, wet in the field, flooring, flooring. What? Wow. He jumps in his car, turns it on, peels out coming out, puts it in, in drive, starts after us. Let me just tell you, I broke the land speed time record of a kid on a bike. And I went fast and I went far. I didn't know Jesus, but I was praying, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and because this wasn't the first time me and my friends had done something like this, we always had a meetup place. <laughs> we had a plan. <laughs> and we get to the place. And, 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 and he didn't chase my friends. He just chased me. And I finally got away. And I get there. And they go, hey, are you okay? And I go, he, 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 I, he, think, he, I'm going to die. 
And this is the same way we live our life. We run out of gas. We will never last when what we do is based out of fear. God's never called you to live your life based out of fear. He's called you to call us to fervor and diligence and faithfulness and trust him in the process, even when we don't want to trust ourselves, to push past our quitting points when the pain of staying where we are is so hard. Come on, don't let fear be the driver. Let faith lead the way. We have to trust him in the process. The apostle Paul said it like this in Acts chapter 20. He says, and now compelled by the spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Friends, the driver matters. The discipline up front will ultimately lead us to the great God of grace. But let me say it like this. Some of you are probably saying, well, I'm pretty good with disciplines. Well, disciplines are not the destination. The discipline is just the door. That's where we have to go and enter in with him. There's doors at, at different establishments. Some open like this. Some you have to push. And a lot of times there's a sensor that when you walk close enough, they start to open. But too many times we've come to a door based in our discipline, and we didn't get to enter in the way, we didn't get the byproduct of what we were hoping for, but now we look at discipline as the problem. The discipline is not the problem. The discipline is not the destination. The discipline is just to the door. You gotta walk a little bit closer to get into the sensor that the doors were open. And he says, ask, seek, knock, and you can enter in. We have to engage in a deeper way. You probably walked to the right door many times, but you didn't give yourself to an intimate connection and commitment. You weren't willing to really go deep in all this because you said, I've tried before and I failed. Friends, quit worrying about perfection. Give yourself to the process. And the process is not complete until you push past your fears and your quitting points. Because God is faithful and just, and he will allow us to enter into a space that we have never entered into before if we just continue to compete and commit ourselves. It comes at a price. It comes at the price of our comfort. It comes at the price of not allowing fear to be the driver. And it comes at the price of being upfront and diligent in our disciplines. And third and finally, the last word is preach. Powerful display, preach. Verses 26 and 27, it says, therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Again, this was the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church at Corneth. Corneth was a community on an isthmus, and every two years, uh, Corneth, like uh, the world, has these almost like Olympic games. They're called the Isthmus Games or the Ithmian Games. And so in the Olympic Games, you can win without winning alone. You can get what they call a bronze medal, or you can do well enough to get the silver. Or if you're the, the main person in your, your event, you can get the gold. But in these games, there was no bronze or silver. There was only one winner. And so Paul knows the people that he's communicating to and the context in which he's exhausting these words. And he's saying, guys, listen, whenever there are the rules of the ways, there's always someone that has to announce them. How many of you are like football fans? NFL, college football, right? Both of you? How about Mariners fans? They really need prayer. <laughs> basketball, basketball fans, come on, bring the Sonics back, Jesus. Yep. And, and, and in this context, it was 
he was ultimately saying there's an umpire or a referee, if you will. And these people came and, and it says that they preached. You know, the preaching was ultimately the announcing of the rules. And so there were a bunch of different types of games. There was javelins, there was wrestlers, there was running, boxing, discus, long jump, charity, chariot, no, the chariot, I was going to say chariot jumping. It's probably not true. It's like the Isthmus X Games, right? Singing was actually considered a uh, athletic, athletic event. Ooh. Get it? Run, run. Never mind. And so the preaching ultimately in this context was announcing the rules and, and, and sharing the, the, the ultimate parameters in which people are to participate. And this is how God works in his promises. Grace is a gift given unto you. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. And he says that he's created some works in advance for us to do by his same grace. And the works that he calls us to participate in will not go outside of the confines of the protection of God's grace for our lives. And he's announcing the rules and he's saying, listen, we need to preach our lives. We need to announce the rules. And the best way, no matter how many times I stand on the stage and get a microphone and exhaust the scriptures, the loudest message my life will ever preach is the way that I live. It's not about as much as what I say. It's about the consistency and the character of God in which he's establishing in me daily, every day. And he's saying, guys, we don't want to just throw punches at the air aimlessly. We don't, we don't want to be inconsistent, right? I love this. He says, no, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. I read that the first time and it's talking about disqualification and it freaked me out. I'm like, okay, if I don't run with God, if I don't let him lead my life and allow the works of God to be produced in my life, I'm not gonna go to heaven no, that's dead, cold religion. Grace is a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. It's yours. You can't lose it. You're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved through works, acts, or deeds. Come on. Religion says I do, therefore I'm accepted. In the goodness of the gospel of grace, you are accepted and we obey and we see God's powerful purpose come to pass. It's all about the driver. Is it fear or is it fervor? Is it aimless doings of trying or is it diligent training and saying, God, I need your grace. I'm not naturally competitive. I'm not naturally gifted. Or maybe you are and this comes a little bit easier to you than you're probably like me in the previous weeks and the rest was wrecking your, your life a little bit in the best ways. But this is what I know. This is about consistency in the core of who we are. That we need to be the same person living in this environment as we do in that environment. Come on. I don't want to see someone off the stage and they go and say, hey, pastor, what are you doing in that place? Places aren't the indicator. They are an element. Let me just say good luck making a right decision in a wrong place. You can set yourself up with discipline to not to go to certain places. Well, I'm, I'm just on mission. Great. But if your struggle is connected to your mission, that's not a good place for you to be. There's another lane. There's a great life that Jesus has called us to live. And there's a powerful purpose connected to all of it. And he says, get on the track. Make the decision. If he paid we stay. If he paid, we play. We're in the game. We're not out of the game. He says, compete. The discipline of making this diligence of giving ourselves to daily commit our lives to Christ and allow the works of God to flow in us and through us. But he says, preach, live this thing consistently because there is a reward. 
There is a crown to be had. There is an, an imperishable promise of God. And it's not your crown of salvation that we should worship. It's the crown of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it's the crown of all the other friends that are far from God that too someday will come and find and follow Jesus too. That we will all rejoice when we lift it up one day in the heavenly ha house of God. And we will all go home and we will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into your reward. He invites us in. And God, if, you're, if, if you guys are feeling anything other than the loving draw of Jesus, that he says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. If you don't have the rest, you can't run. And it's a tandem. It's not in competition. This is just the way he's designed the whole thing to work. And he knows if you've yet to receive the peace of grace that lifts you to the heavenly places, then you can't engage with the work because you're going to be doing it based in fear. Because it's never have to. It's always get to in his glorious grace. Amen. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads, close your eyes.